I think pretty much every South Korean mobile games company has sort of understood the the, the future power of uh, of blockchain and is uh, adopting it. Um, and I guess maybe uh, We Made is not particularly well known. I'm sure uh, uh, Wu Lin will be telling us all about it. Um, but I think probably they are the most uh, active blockchain game publisher. So so we have a great uh, title of the talk. Critical lessons learned after launching more than 30 Web3 games. So plenty of data there. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to meet you. I'm Juan. Uh, I'm the EVP of CorpDev at WeMade. Uh, EVP of CorpDev, I work with third-party developers. I work with uh, publishers. I work with companies that are generally interested in working on, with our chain, trying to put their games on our platform. So uh, yes, I, do a lot of, I, I talk with a lot of third parties. So uh, this session, I'm going to be talking a little about some of the stuff that we've learned. And I'm going to talk a little about my company, a little about myself, so you guys have a, a good idea of where I'm coming from and if, if in fact, I do know what I'm talking about, I, which a lot of times I don't, but hopefully with 30 games or so, uh, I do have a little more experience that I can share. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I started my career uh, in early 2000s, late 90s, and, you know, that's when Internet started happening, Internet connectivity for games. And so before that, you know, you'd buy your games from a CD-ROM or a retail store. You'd buy Nintendo cartridges. But when the Internet happened, it, it enabled two things. And, uh, and this was when I was smack dab in the middle of the industry in Korea, where it allowed different ways to pay. So instead of, of just going to a retail store and buying it for $20, $30, you would actually go, you can, you can pay for it online through time, by the minute or by the hour, or you can do it by your ID, your register ID, or you can even pay per IP, which is a internet cafe model, which we started out in Korea. And so the different ways to pay actually created new business opportunities for companies, for developers, and it brought new types of entertainment for, for the players. And another thing that changed during that time was microtransaction. Because of internet connectivity, a lot of uh, companies were able to uh, make content and, and, you know, uh, and charge people not the $20, $30, but the $0.20, cents, $0.30. Cents. And so uh, this was actually the first uh, microtransaction game in Korea worldwide. So this was in 2000, some, uh, late fall. Uh, this was a game we, were la we launched in Korea. I was, this is a game uh, th with, uh, ne through Nexon, and I was working there. And we launched this game. You know, it was a subscription model, I think 4 or $5 per month. We, we had about 10,000, 8,000, 10,000 concurrent users in the game, which wasn't bad. We were doing about $20,000 a month in revenue. Not bad. Uh, but, you know, we, we wanted to get it bigger. So what we did was we tried something new. We made a, a microtransactions possible. So if you look at the menu, you'll see some items. You'll see a character. You'll see people on the, on the top on those little buckets. Some of them are naked, and some of them have clothes. Some have cool sunglasses. And these are things you could buy. This is like your avatar. And we tried this in 2000. And you know, we, one fall morning, we opened the servers. We let it rip. Nothing happened. The first 10, 20, 30 minutes, the first hour, uh, we're, we didn't see any transactions. So we thought, OK, I guess this model really isn't popular. L a little did we know, a couple later down the road, uh, Korea Telecom, KT, called us and said, hey, we've had some problems with, with server connectivity because they weren't expecting that much traffic from this little game. And so that first month, from $20,000, we hit about $200,000. So we hit about 10 times revenue just going microtransactions. And uh, at that time, we realized, hey, if we have more people coming in to play the game for free, we'll have more people buying. So instead of the subscription model, we got rid of the subscription. So I think we were about a little under 10,000. And within about a month, we, we hit 70,000 uh, concurrent users. So these are things that we tried back in Korea, and this was 2000, the summer of uh, the fall of 2000, so 23 years back. I'm talking about this because this has brought so many changes, and you know a lot of uh, Asian companies and Korean companies started doing this way early on because we saw the potential behind it, and uh, and I think blockchain and Web3 is the same thing. It's it's happening now. I think it is slower to take off, and I think a lot of people have had expectations. But it is slowly happening because, as I've seen the changes that's made uh, all of these things possible, because microtransactions, you know, are like free to play. Well, that's not mainstream. There's still a lot of console gaming. But I mean, if you look at it, like uh, downloadable content, DLCs, skins, season passes are all variations of uh, microtransactions. So I feel like what's, what's happened in, in, in Asia or in Korea 20 something years ago, it took about 10, 15 years to get to mainstream. 
and you know, it might be a certain amount, of, a similar amount of time for blockchain to get there, but it will get there. So now a little about WeMay, the company that I work with. So uh, uh, a couple news about us. So uh, I think we're the only company that Microsoft has backed. Uh, they've uh, not through a fund of theirs, but they've invested directly in our company. We're a public company in Korea. Uh, and uh, so we have about 1,700 people. Uh, we're, we've been in business for about 23 years. So we're not a new Web3 company trying to make games or trying to sell NFTs. Uh, that's, that's not our game. Our game is we want to make good content. We want to make good games for users. And uh, we, we started this. And you know, the, the 1,700 the people in the company, about half of them are game developers. We actually, you know, we still have a lot of game development teams internally, but the rest half are focused on Web3 and blockchain technology. Uh, we develop our own chain. We have a sta uh, stable coin. We, we have a platform. We have a tech stack. So our goal is to become the steam of Web3 games. So and we'll, I'll talk a little about this. So one of the things that we have is we have a portal, uh, WeMixPlay.com. And on this site, we've launched about 28 games. I know the title says 30 games. Uh, hopefully, I, I thought we were going to be launch, launching 30 by the time this week came around. But you know, uh, game de delays are happening. So it'll be 30 next week. But so far, we only have 28 games that we've launched. So it's, but it's close enough. So this is a screenshot of, the, of our site this morning. So you'll see we have a fishing game that we launched about two, three weeks ago. And uh, here we have about 315,000 concurrent users uh, on the play players that are playing our games on our platform. Uh, you know, we, we started this because we have a game called Mirror 4, uh, which, is, which is the, the, the game right over there. Uh, you know, three year, uh, five years ago, we invested in a blockchain uh, technology team and we saw those guys develop, do well. And about two years ago, we launched our uh, mirror game outside of Korea with blockchain. It was, there was a P2E component, but it wasn't real earning. I mean, you couldn't make millions of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars. Maybe you'd make $50 or $100, you'd buy yourself a nice meal. But uh, that game did phenomenally well for us. And we realized through the use of blockchain technology and, and depending on how you implement this in your game, that you could have new users uh, playing the game because there is some value that they're getting out of it. And we decided that we want to make this technology available for other developers. So uh, we have a tech stack, we have tools for developers to bring their Web2 games onto our platform. Uh, we, we'll, we'll work with you guys uh, on developing uh, tokenomics for your game and all, you know, we have 28 games, a lot of different genres. So depending on the genres, tokenomics is different. Uh, we've made a lot of mistakes and we still haven't found the holy grail. I think we are getting closer. But uh, so this session, I'm gonna be talking about some of the things that we've learned. Uh, yeah, these are the different type of games that we have. So Web3 tokenomics, a lot of words on, on blockchain technology. I, I've been in gaming for about 23, four years. I, I'm not an engineer, so there's no need to know any of this, except I think maybe tokenomics and Web3. I think Web3, is, is I think a lot of people understand it or have a better understanding of it than six months ago. But what, what en enables Web3 obviously is the technology. And in Web3 gaming, I think there's two ways that users or players can have some value. One is through NFTs and other through is tokens. And a lot of our games, we focus on tokens because uh, we've realized or we thought that you know, interoperability of a to or NFTs in different games through different, different engines, different genres, much easier said than done. I don't think there's any, uh, any cases that we've seen. But with tokenomics, you can derive value uh, from one token and you can translate that to a, a, another medium and then put through that medium, go to another game. And so we've, uh, this is our uh, guiding philosophy. Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, token, tokenomics is token economics. Uh, game developers have developed uh, in-game economics for 30, 40 years. Diablo, every, every game that we, we like, we've heard of, there's always uh, in-game economics that, that makes the game fun, there's game balance. You know, if, if the game doesn't have good economics, you know, the game's gonna fail. So, you know, I think a lot of Korean companies have had experience making this because we've started out with online gaming. And when you make online games, you're playing with other people. So the interaction of the game is, it's not just you and the game, it's you and all the other players out there. So I think in that sense, Korean developers have, have had an edge de uh, designing game economics 
And so I, I, in, in that sense, I think we do have a little uh, head start. And I think, uh, as uh, John mentioned earlier today, uh, come to us, great company. We made, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're the two bigger companies in, in this space in Korea. And it's not because uh, we're special, we're smarter. It's just that we've decided that we think that this technology will change the world. And so we've put a lot of uh, development behind it. Uh, these are some of the things that I've seen the last three years, uh, you know, the different generations of tokenomics. Uh, you know, first generation, you know, there's gameplay, there's tokenomics, and there's users. Uh, you know, gameplay quality is getting better. Uh, I think a lot of people mistake gameplay quality as better graphics, which, which is not. Uh, you know, I go to different conferences, and every year people are saying, oh, this game looks so great. I mean, it would do so well with on blockchain, which, you know, graphics don't determine the, uh, the success of the game at all. So, you know, when I see, when, I, when somebody tells me, I've got a great looking game, I say, you know, that's probably not the right approach. Uh, tokenomics as well, I think early, early stage, you know, it was all about earning, you, you put some money in, you, you know, and you know, in hopes of getting something in, uh, as a reward back, there's a financial incentive. I think now a lot of developers have realized that model is not sustainable, and I think uh, we're getting closer to actually having uh, tokenomics that are part of the game, which, which gives some value to the users. And you know, the end goal is not to become rich. I mean, if that is the goal, then you know, th this is not the type of game you want to play. You want to go to Vegas, you want to do some other kind of games. And the users, I think, have come around because I think before, the people that were playing some of the earlier uh, Web3 games, Axies and, and the like, were focused on, they didn't really care about gameplay, it was all about the money, but I think now, as we'll see stronger and better games, people realize, hey, I think it's, it's not just about earning money, and that, that should be a smaller part of the, the experience. Okay, now going to some of the, the lessons that we have. I, these are some examples of, of tokenomics designs we have for our games. Uh, you know, we usually look at it from a light user and a hardcore user perspective, because a lot of the light core users are the ones that feed the system so that hardcore users can utilize the tokenomics. So when we look at game design, uh, sorry, token design for, for new games, these are the, some of the things that we look at. Here uh, in case say, you know, one of the earlier games, it took us about, it took a user about 10 days to uh, get a token uh, within the game. And uh, in case B, it, it took about three days. You know, we're, we're doing these different things and designing different things because we, we don't know what works, what works better. And so, yeah, we've got in case C, case D. Uh, yeah, we've got different models uh, for different games, different genres. One of the more interesting I, I want to point out is uh, case F, which is a game that we launched uh, earlier this uh, in March, I think. But what we did about this game was instead of using one coin, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the graph on the right, you'll see there's coin A, which is a coin that's uh, received, earned through the game. But then there's coin B, which is part of a coin, which is a coin that's from another game, predecessor of this game. So it's like a series. Uh, it's Legend of Mirror 4, then Legend of Mirror M. So it's a series game. And the second part of the series, we've acknowledged the users that have been a loyal fan in the earlier game. So once they've earned a certain amount of tokens, they can come into this game and have some privilege. Uh, we're giving them some acknowledgement. Hey, thanks for being a fan of this game. Now you can use that token and take it with coin A, because you still have to do play this, uh, the new version of the game. And then you'll get coin C. And with coin C, you have some say in how some of the events are run. run. So like, we have governance programs where like, how often do you want the dungeons to be open? How big do you want the guild rates to be? We have these things. And uh, you know, this has been something very interesting for us uh, because we haven't had you know, a lot of game uh, uh, developers or publishers, Web3 uh, companies talk about interoperability. Uh, take my NFT, put it in your NFT. You know, in reality, it, it is very difficult. But what we've done with tokenomics is we've, we've actually brought that token into a new game. And then you know, we've seen numbers, uh, we've seen old users or, or from the previous game be seated into this new game. So some of the new things that we're trying now is can we bring games that are not from the same universe, not from the same uh, series? So maybe from an RPG to a casual game or from a casual game to an RPG. So you know, because we have a lot of games, I think we're gonna be trying more of this and uh, some of it's gonna work, some of it's gonna fail and we've, we've made a lot of mistakes. But I think the fact that we're trying these things, I think it'll make the whole industry a little better because you know, any, anybody can play our games and know and if you play enough, you'll get to understand the tokenomics. So there's no secret here. Uh, other, other learning, 
uh, is actually, I think this is uh, one of the things that's very interesting. So I'm gonna be talking about four type of games here and how uh, token supply, how you mine or you get the tokens within the game versus the trading volume, how they affect uh, uh, the token price. So this is uh, game A, we launched, uh, supply is the yellow curve, a lot of supply from the very beginning. And so there was a lot of trading volume, great, but then, you know, it didn't work out because a lot of supply, you know, uh, you know uh, crap, coin crash, coin price crash. Second game, so we're like, all right, let's limit supply. So instead of getting a huge supply from the very get-go, you know, we limited supply. And so obviously with limited supply, there's limited trading volume. And so with li limited trading volume, you think, hey, you know, th th there should be a healthy balance. Well, this is what happened. Like, why, why did this happen? And so our analysis of this is because there wasn't enough, enough uh, token out there for the hardcore users or the whales to actually buy tokens in the game uh, from other users. So there wasn't that, it wasn't a circular system So because the supply was so limited. So that, that was probably a big reason that we think it didn't work. So the next iteration is the same as uh, game type A. You know, we had a huge supply of uh, 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 tokenomics from the very beginning, tokens from the very beginning, a big trading volume. Yeah, but it crashed. But what I do want to point out about this graph is you look at uh, what's happened in uh, November and January, you'll see a little bump that goes up there and, of, and you see the trading volume go, as, go up as well. But supply amount didn't change. What we did here was, uh, you know, we, we've analyzed this game and we thought, let's try something. So we added something new into the game. We added a new system or a little, little something that users actually needed to get in order to uh, bring their tokens out of the game. And so for about two and a half months, uh, the, the price roughly doubled. And, and uh, it went back down, but it's still 50% of what it was before we implemented the system. And uh, we were looking at it saying, hey, is there backlash from the community because we changed the tokenomics? Is there, you know? And you know, the community, there wasn't a lot of issue behind it. And so we felt like, hey, you know, this is a model that might work if you've designed a game and there's something wrong with it and the coin price goes down, how can you get that coin price back up and by changing some parts within the game? So this was an exercise in that. And uh, the, finally, this is uh, one of our more latter games. Uh, so we launched this game in February. So you can see that supply amount started out really low. It's gradually progressing. But then you see the trading volume being way up high there. And it's like, how can this be if there's no supply? Like somebody has to come up, with, earn the tokens within the game to actually sell it to other users. What we did was uh, we created a swap pool uh, sizable enough where even if there wasn't enough tokens that were mined within the game, they could get it from our uh, decentralized exchange so, or, or our pool. And so we tried this and uh, you know, th this, is, uh, this is a couple months old, but you still see that Compared to the other games, the token prices are, it's a, a lot more smoother. Fluctuation isn't as bad. And uh, so we think we found something with this, uh, this, this skill or this, this tactical thing that we've done. And so, uh, you know, moving forward, mo all of our games uh, launching after this, we've created swap pools. And, you know, how big is the swap pool? How much users do you expect to trade? I mean, you know, and it depends on the game. There's a lot of things to think about. But this is a thing, something that we've done, and I, I think this is, you know, it's a, it's a working model. Anyway, I've got about two minutes left. So these are the lessons that I've learned. Uh, so uh, beautiful token graphs are a rare thing. I mean, it, they're very hard. Uh, two, you make supply easy, and then, you know, there's inflation. You, res re you restri restrict supply early, and there's not enough transactions, there's not enough volume going around. And if there isn't enough volume, it, it's, there's so much volatility. Uh, token prices will, will fall with even s just small amounts of uh, uh, trading. So that part, you know, we, we monitor every, every day, every week we see token prices. We have guys looking at it, seeing if there's anything we can learn from it. And finally, this is, this is the thing that I want to stress out, uh, point out is a lot of people think that good tokenomics can make your game good or there, there could be some value there, but it actually isn't. It's part of gameplay. It's a game design mechanism. So if you have a pretty crappy game, this is not going to help at all. And I, you know, I think a lot of companies have learned or are still learning this because I, I talk with developers wanting grants. Uh, and you know, They come to me and say, hey, we've got this game. It looks good. Uh, you know, we think it will do well. Can you give me a grant? 
we don't look at it from a Web3 perspective. We look at it as a game. Is the game fun? Will it stick? Will it work? And you know, that's how we evaluate games. There's a whole bunch of things that we're doing right now. I'm, I'm short on time, but uh, I do want to show, show you where we've progressed in the last 15 months. So uh, last year, March, we had seven games, you know, one platform, 25 games. Now, uh, 15 months later, we've signed 100 games on our platform. We've launched uh, 28 live games, you know, different regions, uh, different genres. So, you know, this is where we've been coming, uh, coming through. And I think, uh, give us, by the end of this year, our goal is to have uh, 60 live Web3 games. So, as John was saying earlier, uh, you know, I, I think we'll still be on top of that, of his list of most Web3 games launched. All right, I think that's time for me. Uh, thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, if you want to get in touch, uh, you know, that's my email up there. So f feel free to reach out. All right, thank you. Excellent stuff. Always stay up there, stay up there. Always love a, a, good, a good graph um, with different axes on. Um, so uh, any questions to kick the, uh, kick the afternoon off? I have a question if no one else does. So um, if you haven't got one, I've got one. Um, so I so really like the experimentation you're doing. Um, that, that's always a good starting point is to, is to be humble and <laughs> look at the data. Um, I guess there's two, there was sort of two obvious things that sort of came to mind where, where you're launching games with the tokens and then saying tokens are sort of liquid and you can do things to sort of interop, interop, make them interop, interoperable. Um, obviously, one way of doing it, which I think is more come to us is view, is they launch their games without blockchain and then sort of add the blockchain in sort of later on. Or sort of an alternative option would be just use a, to begin with, just use a stable coin, like your own stable coin or, or, or a USDC or something like that, which, which sort of, you know, takes away some of the sort of fun and the trading bit, but equally allows sort of, it gives you a bit more control over economies in the early stages. So have you thought about that sort of stuff at all? Yeah, we've done that with uh, our latter games. We do have a stable, to uh, stable coin, uh, US dollar back. So, I mean, uh, you know, we use that for some of our latter games. So we, we do have that component, so there's less volatility. And a lot of our games, are, are games where you just download, download off the App Store or Google Play. There's no Web3. You don't need a wallet to start our game. You just download the game and play as is. At a certain point in time, level 5, level 50, at a certain point in time, there's functions. If you want to access that function, you want to connect your wallet. You don't have to. They're out of the, 100, uh, the, the, the user, the demographic, only about 30% of the users actually have connected wallets, even for our biggest game. So 70% of the users don't have a wallet, they don't care about the wallet, but 30% do. And this is for our bigger games. On average, it's, it's in the teens. It's under 20% of our users that have actually connected wallets. And our gamers are gamers, but they know crypto, but still, I mean, the majority of our users are not just playing for crypto. I would say 20% 20, 20 is pretty impressive, <laughs> to be honest. We work hard at it. We try to get the number up. Yeah. And a very quick question uh, again. So um, obviously you're operating through Apple and Google. You don't have any issues nope. with them at all? No. We have not had any. Sh we do have, I mean, we're a platform. So there are games that we, public we develop and we publish. They're third party games that we just provide SDKs and they onboard to our platform. And so those individual developers might have issues. Uh, some of them, because it, it's not anything with Web3, it's some of their policy stuff that I think Apple has said, no, we, we can't allow it. So there were maybe like two games that's only on Google Play. But uh, I mean, you know, we try to abide by all the rules and we tell our guys, hey, you abide by the rules of, of the platform. That's just how it is with Google and Apple. Excellent. Thank you very much. That was, that was very good. Right. Thank you. Lovely.